Hello there, pod fans. I hope you're well. Welcome back to the Total Water Polo podcast. We've got a really cool guest today. It's Olympiakos's and Greece's Olympic silver medalist from Tokyo, Konstantinos Genadunias. It's really, really cool chat. He's very well spoken, really good at English, and it's, it's a fantastic conversation. I really hope you enjoy it. Just before we start, as usual, just a quick reminder, please take full advantage of our discount code on Wear Water Polo. Go to wearwaterpolo.com, type in our discount code PODCAST10 to get a little bit of money on any kit orders, any t-shirts, any trunks, any costumes, anything like that. If it's not too much hassle, give us a like, give us a subscribe, give us a review, anything you can on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy my chat with Konstantinos Genadunis. delighted to welcome Konstantinos Genadunias to the podcast. Konstantinos, how are you? Hi, hi, I'm doing good. good. How are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm well, thank you. Um, really, really relieved that we finally got you on the podcast. A few technical issues. Also, uh, you know, I've been texting you like mad for a few weeks and I know you've been mega busy, so it's it's finally uh, great to have you yeah, have you on the show. It's my my pleasure, my pleasure. You've had a really busy, busy schedule the last few week or so or two weeks um do you mind just sharing with our listeners maybe what 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 a week has looked like for you so what you've been up to your training routine and stuff yeah this uh actually these couple of weeks have been really busy with practices because uh we were supposed to play against russia uh last week with the national team but with all the ukraine war problems now uh the game got cancelled uh, so we had two very busy weeks of uh, practicing, almost uh, two practices every day, um, you know, trying to prepare because with Olympiacos, we have some really important games in the Champions League coming up. Um, other than these past two weeks, this season uh, has been really busy because, you know, we're trying to fit in the Champions League, the Greek League, Greek Cup, and now the upcoming uh, World Championship in uh, in Budapest, and then the European Championship in September. So, in order to fit all these games into into a season, uh, you know, um, we have almost two games every week this season: uh, Greek League, Champions League. You know, and it's tough games. And uh, I mean, it's fun. It's really fun playing games instead of uh, just practicing because. To be honest, I'd rather have two games per week than have no games and just practice all along. Uh, but yeah, it's been really busy. Uh, it's been really interesting. And I think uh, this ending of this season will be very, very interesting. Yeah, I'm just really excited to see what's going to happen. Good. Yeah, been working hard, been very busy, been earning your money, all the rest of it. Uh, you, you referenced there the Champions League. We're obviously going to talk to you about that. But just, just first, maybe if you can cast your mind back to the start of your water polo journey um so when you were a junior do, do you remember your first memories when you got into water polo as a as a young kid yeah absolutely uh, i joined water polo because my older brother was playing uh, i joined a small club here in athens um i was eight years old uh started competing uh when i was 10 years old you know uh under 11s I think that was the I don't even remember how old you know the other kids were I remember I was younger than the rest of the kids uh ended up playing for 10 years in that club uh started playing for the junior national team when I was uh 14 in 2007 and uh, I had my first uh game with the men's national team in 2011 when I was 18 years old and that's when I moved to the United States, uh, so I can play in the collegiate championship, uh, champion, uh, championship, sorry, uh, where I joined, uh, the university of Southern California. And, uh, I was there for four years from 2011 to 2015. Um, and then, uh, after four successful years there, I ended up, uh, coming back here to Greece 
and joining Olympiacos and still playing for them. That's my seventh season. Just uh, really enjoying my time here. Just before we talk about um, your your time in America, um, just just a little bit about Greece at a junior level. They seem to produce for men and women really really good players consistently. All the all the teams are strong. Um, in your opinion, from someone that's come through that that system, why do you think why do you think that is? Do you think it's the the coaching? Do you think it's maybe the club system or or something else? Uh, I think it's a combination of everything. Um, from I remember from when I was uh, a young young water polo player, we just you know we had coaches that would make us you know focus on what we're doing, focus in practicing. Uh, all year long, even when I was playing for my club team or with the national team during the junior national team during the summer, um, you know, Greece is a country where uh, you can, you know, you can play water polo in the in the ocean, you know. And uh, in my opinion, it should have been our national sport, but unfortunately for us, uh, basketball and soccer or football, uh, you know, has taken over years now. Um, However, you know, we have a lot of open pools. Uh, a lot of kids enjoy swimming and joining water polo. So there's a lot of kids coming to the pools and trying out. So, you know, you're going to find some talent amongst so many kids. And I think a uh, combination of that and having good coaches uh, and having the good opportunities to, you know, compete in, in a high level uh, in a tournament, uh, world championship or European championship, you know, uh, players get to evolve through that. And uh, I think it's been a big part of Greece, you know, producing so many talents over the past few, uh, few years. Yeah, um, we, we do actually have a question from, from someone. I'd normally do it in the second part, but it's just mm-hmm. based based on what you, um, uh, something you've just said there. Um, e. Janorian on Instagram asked, how hard is it to keep the young players in the sport in Greece? Um, you, you spoke there about, oh, you know, it sounds perfect going in the sea, nice sun, Mediterranean uh, weather, all the rest of it. Um, in your experience, though, um, is the player retention quite high in Greece for water polo? You know, uh, I'll answer kind of differently. It's hard to uh, make them stay, to be honest, because... Uh, you know, once you're growing up, we've all been through that stage of our life and we're like 16, 17, 18. And, you know, you got to focus both on your school and on water polo or, um, you know, you have your first girl girlfriend or boyfriend and you don't you're not sure still what your priorities are. Um, and, then, and then, you know, when you're 18, you want to go out, you want to enjoy some, you know, the fun parts of life. Uh, so that's one one, you know tough situation where every every young player has to deal with uh and that's i mean partially it's not partially the bigger part is on the parents you know to help the kids stay focused on you know what what's the right thing to do but there's never one right thing to do it's it's you know what 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 each athlete what each kid wants to do in their life um the problem with water polo is that unlike what I said before, basketball and and, and football, uh, you don't make a lot of money. So a lot of kids say, oh, why would I do something, spend so much time, uh, dedicate all my time and all my good, you know, years to not make money and, and have a, a great future, you know? Um, however, uh, you know, some, some kids like me, uh, they want to take that risk and sacrifice you know, a lot of time. And to be honest, I would, I would do it all over again. For me, it worked out perfectly. Uh, I'm enjoying what I'm doing, you know, might not be making the same amount of money that football players and, and basketball players are making, but I love what I do. Yeah. We love, we love, we love to hear that. We'll, uh, we'll talk about America now then. Um, as you said, in, in 2011 to 2015, 2014, 2015, you um you played for USC. Um, mm-hmm. You won three consecutive NC two A's championships there. Obviously, a really successful time for you at the club, uh, and you alluded to that earlier. Um, you also person on a personal note, you took over as the club's 
uh, well, the university's all-time top goal scorer with 261 career goals. Uh, and we've got, again, we've got loads of questions from, from people, you know, lots of young kids in Greece getting in touch. And they, they're basically asking, you know, how did you make the decision to go to America, whether the memory is good there? Um, we've got a few questions in a minute that I'll ask, you know, about the difference between going to university in America or staying in Europe and playing water polo. I don't want to um, overwhelm you all at once, but just um, maybe you can just summarize the experience that you had playing in America. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, I, I decided to uh, you know make that leap and, and uh, leave my hometown of Athens and go to the United States because uh, my English is pretty good. I went to a, a, an, an American school since I was a little kid, uh, an American high school here in Athens. And uh, I was introduced to that opportunity that I could, you know, join a university, uh, earn a scholarship. And it intrigued me from the first moment. And uh, I remember I was 16 or, yeah, almost 17 when I started sending emails and trying to get in touch with coaches. Uh, USC was the, the one that just made the best impression. And I, I knew I, I had to be there. I had to join that university. Uh, in the beginning, I was rejected, uh, but after uh, a junior European championship uh, in 2010 in Germany, uh, we, my team and I got the, we won the second place. We lost in the penalty shootout to Italy, uh, and it happened that I got the MVP of that tournament, and uh, I immediately emailed the uh, Jovan Vavic, the coach back then at USC, uh, and, you know, it immediately, uh, he immediately sent me an, uh, a response saying, I'll call you tomorrow. And that's when we, you know, we kind of connected and he told me that uh, next, the next year, so a year later after that call, uh, he would be, I could, I could join him if I, if I got the, you know, the, the good scores and, and the SATs and all the, the requirements that you have to go through uh, for, uh, to go to university. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. I joined them in 2011. Uh, it was, to be honest, a life-changing experience for me. I would do it all over again. Uh, I wish I had more years over there. It was, uh, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, I would definitely recommend it to any, any athlete, not, even, not only water polo, any athlete that has the opportunity to join a university and, you know, experience those four, four years or five you know, some athletes are lucky enough to be five years over there. Uh, I would, I would definitely recommend them with the blink of an eye. So, um, yeah, uh, I don't remember any other uh, questions or uh, that other response. I launched them all at you at once. It's it's just remarkable to hear that uh, you were turned down. And and as you said, you you said it there, and you took the words out of my mouth. The the rest was history. You, you went on to be one of one of the most successful players. Um, the university's ever seen. Um, yeah, so thank you for Prokovs and Alex underscore zero three zero for for th th those questions. Um, Magna Polo and Montas Seven. Um, so this is a question I asked um, a little bit earlier. Is what's the biggest difference between American and European polo? The standards both are, are high, but the club the club system in Europe and versus the collegiate system in America. What what for you is the biggest difference? The biggest difference, I think the biggest difference is, um, first of all, the season in, in, in the collegiate water polo is very short. It's from September till early December because, um, you know, it's the NCAA is trying to fit in a lot of sports, women's and men's, so they don't have as much time. And I think what makes... Um, European water polo just being on a higher level is that uh, it's it's actually professional. You know, many people just like me do it as their job, their only occupation. In 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 the collegiate level, you know, you're you're a student first, and then you're an athlete. And uh, it's not like, for example, basketball or American football, where there's a lot of money going in, and you know, athletes are you know trying to prove themselves every game every season so they can get into the draft and go into the nba or the nfl or in baseball in the mlb um 
So no, that immediately just downgrades a little water polo. Um, and the other huge difference in, in the States is that only California and a little bit of New York and a little bit of Arizona has water polo. All the other states are not really involved. Uh, I've seen, you know, uh, through USA Water Polo and through Tony Azevedo and Jesse Smith and Mara Moses, all these um, uh, now retired water polo players trying to uh, expand water polo in the States and they're doing an amazing job. But there's still a long, long way to go. So I think this is what makes a big difference that in Europe, in almost every you know big country, there's a league and there's uh, you know teams that are actually willing to pay uh, money for athletes to compete for them and compete in their league. Uh, we have a Champions League, you know, European League, and then there's um, you know academies for almost every team. So there's a lot of you know talent coming in, unlike in the United States where. It's not that big yet. Yeah. In your words there, um, just towards the beginning, you said you're a student first and then an athlete. And we did have a question um, from E. Janorian, who, um, sorry, not, not E. Janorian, it's um, to Circus, who said, how difficult for you was it to combine studies and water polo? How difficult is it? Yeah, sometimes it was very difficult because uh, we had to wake up around 5.30 in the morning, had to be uh, at practice at 6 in the morning. And then when it was done by 7.30, sometimes I had to go to class at 8 or 9. Uh, you know, and then you had to go through a day full of classes and then go back to practice at 4, you know. Um, but in the beginning, to be honest, it was way harder than – than the rest of the, you know, the three, four years I was there because I wasn't used to it, but you get used to it. You know, uh, personally, I'm a, a person who really likes to follow a schedule and be really organizational. So I was always, you know, on time with my homework, with my, uh, you know, uh, with everything I had to do really consistent. So, you know, I followed my schedule, you know, really, really, uh, strictly and you know I man that's one way to do it to be successful in both parts you know we had I had teammates that you know did not really focus on their classes or water polo and uh there's a rule in in the NCAA where you if you don't keep up your GPA above 2.0 so your grades are not up you cannot compete in, in games and practice with the team so they they kind of force you into being a, a good student too and I think the secret is what I said earlier, you just need to, you know, follow a strict schedule so you can be successful in both parts. Yeah, it's really good advice. Um, we'll move on then a little bit. You said that you, you had your debut when you was 18. And obviously, you were, you were during, at America, you were in America, sorry, um, for the early part of, of, of the decade. Um, leading up to Rio then, um, when you were in America, was was going to the Olympics at Rio, uh was that in the back of your mind? Was that was that a big goal for you, or did you not really think about it and it kind of just happened? It wasn't on the back of my mind. It was all over my mind uh, because I had the opportunity to stay in the United States and you know find a job, uh, maybe quit water polo, maybe become a coach over there. Uh, but my life's not my life. My career's goal, my water polo goal, always was to compete in the Olympics. Uh, so returning in 2015, that was my only goal. I remember, uh, for the last couple of months or maybe last month that I was there, it was, um, April, April, yeah, April and May of 2015, we weren't practicing because that, that was exam season. Um, we had exams, so we weren't uh, allowed to practice as a team. And I just remember practicing every day by myself, going to the to the weight room, going to the pool, maybe sometimes twice per day. Uh, I was really focused, and I think that was what what uh, you know helped me achieve that goal. Because I I returned back to Greece uh, in end of May of 2015, and. Uh, in August, I was playing for the national team in the World Championship in Kazan, where we won the the bronze medal. Um, so yeah, to answer that question, it was all over in my mind. Uh, you know, competing in the Olympics 
you know, I think it should be every athlete's dream. And it was my dream, and I accomplished it in 2016. Unfortunately, not with a medal, but that medal came, you know, a few months ago in Tokyo. Yeah, yeah. All over your mind, it was your dream. And as you said, it was your water polo goal to go to the Olympics. Um, what was it like being told that you had you'd achieved that that goal that you would be going um obviously as you've said you you did go subsequently in tokyo and we'll talk about that how how did that feel when you found out i mean it's the best feeling you know i was uh all the hard all the hard work paid off um that wasn't the end though it's important to to clarify that because once you achieve a goal uh you shouldn't just relax and you know sit on it you just need to keep going um but you know in 2016, making the Olympic team uh, was absolutely wonderful. I was playing amongst uh, some great, great Greek players. Uh, and, you know, like I said before, we, we had a really good team. We had a really good team. I think we deserved a medal because in 2015 and earlier in 2016, we had some, uh, you know, great performances. Uh, a lot of teams, you know, had us being one of the favorites for um for a medal, but a really good Italian team kicked us out in the quarterfinal. Um, but yeah, to answer that question, it was it meant everything, meant the world to me. Just uh, realizing that you know every every step I, I took, every you know inch of you know hard swimming and a hard workout, and every kilo I lifted in in the weight room just paid off, and I made that Olympic team. Um, did. Did your experience at Rio, um, play a bit becoming an Olympian, playing okay, a bit disappointing for you to finish sixth, but it's not it's not a total disgrace at all. Um, what was the big takeaway from Rio for you? Did anything change, maybe in the way that you trained or your outlook or your you know obviously you've achieved a massive goal by did you then re reset your your aims for your career? Um, I, I can't say I changed, you know, my mindset. Cause like I said, I accomplished the goal of, uh, competing in the Olympics, but I had to, you know, keep working in order to achieve more of my goals. And, um, uh, in 2016, I, I, I was one of the youngest, if not, no, I was the second youngest on that team. And I, I didn't have the playing time I have now. I used to play maybe two quarters. Um, and I just realized that I had to work harder and be more competitive in order to gain more playing time and help my team out. Uh, and I mean, obviously some of the guys left, some of the older guys left, quit the national team after Rio. Uh, so immediately I got more playing time, but I made sure that I improved in every um, aspect of my game in order to, you know, help Greece uh, achieve uh, goals in, in world championships, European championship and the Olympics. There's a lot of space and time between your first Olympic experience and your second, and obviously so much happened in between. We'll obviously talk about stuff that's happened with the club, um, but Tokyo comes around eventually after after obviously COVID hits. Um, how how did how did COVID affect your preparations? I don't want to talk too much about COVID, but obviously it did have an impact for a lot of athletes. Um, what was your immediate reaction when it was cancelled? Um, in the beginning, I think all of us were just disappointed because uh, uh, just in hearing that the Olympics got cancelled and uh, we didn't know if they're going to happen the next year, you know, just missing out on one of the... We don't have 100 years of, uh, you know, athletic years to compete in the Olympics. We all, You know, if you're lucky, you have two or three or four. Some athletes are fortunate enough uh, to have five Olympics, you know, under their, their belts. Um, however, yeah, we were disappointed that they got canceled, but, uh, you know, looking back now, uh, my team, the Greek national team, we were actually lucky because we weren't playing that well, uh, in 2020. And, uh, we weren't sure if we were going to qualify from the Olympic tournament, which also got, got the qualifying tournament, sorry, uh, which also got canceled. Um, but yeah, in the beginning, we're disappointed. But now looking back, uh, I believe it was good for us. It's, you know, we got more time to practice. We got more time together. Uh, and, you know, the results just, just prove that what I'm saying might be right. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, so you you land in Tokyo. Everything's completely different to Rio, I guess, or or not. Um, was there was there anything in a weird way that was very similar and very um, reminiscent of your previous experience? I mean, the the Olympic Village was pretty much the same, uh, other than that we had to wear masks everywhere and we had to uh, get tested every day for COVID. Um, but yeah, just competing in an empty stadium definitely uh, wasn't the same. Uh, it's you know, it's partly you know, being around so many people from different cultures, different culture, uh, different cultures in different countries is what makes the Olympics uh, so different. And, uh, you know, playing in a full stadium is definitely more and more fun than playing in an empty stadium. And it definitely made made uh, a difference. Um, however, you know, we're professionals. We had to deal with that. And, uh, you know, from the first game, I think my team was focused on, on our goal and it just went well. Yeah, I mean, we're on to it now. Um, you finished top of the group in the group stage really really good performances you beat hungry um anyway you beat them twice eventually but you drew with it italy japan you narrowly got past but you probably deserved it obviously south africa was a team you expected to beat, and the usa you know it's, it's a decent result they've got you know had lots of players playing in europe so they were they were in all right shape um did this give you a lot of confidence um the team that you'd you know, finishing top of a group, you know, it's not a medal. It's not a, you don't get a trophy. You don't get a check for, you know, any money or anything. But it does show that you are in good shape and you're looking looking slick. Yeah, absolutely. I think the first game against Hungary is what gave us a lot of confidence um, because we, we definitely weren't the favorites for that game. Um the Hungarians couldn't believe it that that they lost. It was the first time they lost a, a Greek team uh, in the Olympic level, and uh, it gave us a lot of confidence going into uh, the second game against Italy. We were up six uh, two. We ended up tying six six. I think it was just a, a very bad fourth quarter for us. Also, the referees didn't really help us. <laughs> um, yeah, it happens. Um, however, both these game, uh, games, I think those were the games that actually, you know, uh, we proved to ourselves that we're here, you know, we're in Tokyo to compete and we're here to win because uh, we competed against two great teams and we managed to, you know, beat Hungary and tie Italy. Um, so it definitely gave us a huge morale boost for the for the rest of the tournament. Yeah, I mean, you know, we never know, but you know, if you lose that first game and then, you know, a tough prospect uh, Italy, you know, potentially we could be look, talking about something, uh, an outcome that's completely different. But obviously, you did finish top, which helped with the crossover a little bit. Quarterfinals, uh-huh. you played uh, Montenegro, who had who'd been in really good shape. I think they they won the World League um, earlier earlier on in the in the summer. Um, to beat them was obviously really impressive, and you yourself, I think you you got five in that game. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, how exciting! How exciting was it that you were going to be in the semi-finals against Hungary again? First of all, I want to say something that you mentioned earlier that you know, being first in the group, it's not uh, you know, it's it's an accomplishment, but it's not a medal. It's not something you know that you're going to be successful for sure. Uh, and I think that was one of the big lessons that we learned in Rio uh, because we got really, really excited when we qualified to the quarterfinals and uh, we kind of relaxed. Um, and in Tokyo, uh, I remember after, you know, after uh, the United States, the last game where we uh, where we knew we we're going to be first, uh, you know, there was excitement, but some of the more experienced guys, you know, we had a lot of young guys on the team. Uh, that was the first Olympics. I think the more experienced guys try to, you know, relax the atmosphere and let everyone know that nothing happened yet. You know, we need to remain focused. And that was a big part of our success. Oh, no, I was just going to say, that's that's really interesting. Do you remember yourself thinking, OK, for, well, five years ago, we we did exactly what we've just done. We've dominated, not dominate the group, but done well in the group. 
now actually I need to really emphasize to the younger boys and my teammates that we need to keep our feet on the ground. Remember yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because uh, I, it wasn't only in the in, in Rio. It was also um, in 2017 in the World Championship, in 2016 in the European Championship, where you know we were really close to winning a medal, really close to doing something, and we ended up not doing because of a wrong mindset, in my opinion. Um, and you know the timing was perfect. We we you know. We just clicked, and we just knew we had to stay focused uh, in the biggest stage, you know, in the in the Olympics. So I'm, I'm happy it happened there. Um, so I just want to answer about the quarterfinal. Yeah, it was it was one of those game those games where you had to win, you know. In in, in Rio, we lost that game, and it's you know it's a really thin line uh, between success and failure. So we we knew it was that game that we had to win, and. I remember from the first moment we were so focused, especially in defense, that we we gave Montenegro, you know, very narrow opportunities to score in us, and it was a good game for us. It was a bad game for them. I remember they had some, you know, uh, guys getting excluded, and from the third quarter, pretty much the end of the third quarter, the match was, you know, pretty much leaned towards us. So it was a good game for us. One of our guests on the podcast a few weeks ago, Denis Kameni. He um, he talked about at an Olympic Games, uh, often if you get to the later stages, you play teams again and it's really difficult to actually replicate the same result against a team that you've already played. Um, so you met Hungary in the, in the semi-finals and you'd already beaten them, albeit by one goal in the earlier game, so 10-9. Um, did you approach that game differently no to be honest no because uh our defense was great from the beginning of the tournament and we knew that if we wanted to beat uh the hungarian team we had to you know have a great defensive game uh because if you allow too many goals against hungary you're you know nine out of ten times you're going to lose so we knew that we wouldn't win that game with a score you know 13 at 12 we knew that we had to keep the score uh low and, you know, our goalkeeper had a great, great, great day, a uh, great game against Hungary. And, you know, they had, they still have great players, Dennis Varga, Martin Vamos, uh, Zalanki, and Christian Manherz. And I think we managed to uh, get the ball off their hands and let other players beat us. Uh, you know, and I, if I'm not mistaken, it was one of the games that the two left-handers, Martin Vamos and Zalanki, did not score. Uh, oh no! Obama scored uh, scored one. He he didn't score in the first game. That's still pretty uh, so still pretty decent though, isn't it? You know that. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're so deadly. that that was yeah, absolutely. It was a great accomplishment. Uh, Dennis Vargas scored two goals in us, um, but you know he's a very talented. He can score any time he wants. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I think it was it was just uh, we had the same mindset going in the into the first game um, in the group stage. And it just it, it went really well, even better than the first game. Yeah. So, yeah, that, I think that's what gave us the win. Yeah, I was about to say, I, I wondered if actually it was an easier, not not necessarily easier, but more of a enjoyable game to be be part of than the first game. But you, you win the game, you win the match, and you've made history, okay? And Greece is, you know, a world-leading country in water polo. You know, you yourself know at Olympiakos, there's no better atmosphere in any any stadium or any pool in in the world um you know obviously really competitive in Europe and always fighting for medals and this is the first time at the olympics that you finally get that kind of monkey off off your back that you've finally done it and as you know as we've spoken about before you haven't you know you have won a medal but you're in the final you're there to to compete for the gold um but how how happy were you all you know, after that hungry game, as you had your team talk, how you know how relieved were you that you'd you'd made history? Yeah, I I can't even start describing the the emotions and the feelings. I just get I get goosebumps now just thinking about it. Um, it's it's something you know special, especially about what you said. It was the first time in the history of our sport. Um, and I just remember all my teammates' faces and my coaches and you know and all the 
the, the Greek people that, are, that, that were there with us, uh, everybody's so emotional. Uh, you know, it's, it's something, it's what I said earlier, you know, it's a life goal. It's uh, hard work paying off and it was just amazing. And I, I really hope that I, I can, I can be part of another winning team like that. Good, good, good. Uh, obviously, uh, and I don't want to bring it up, um, it might be hurtful, but maybe not for the reasons you've just said. But obviously in the final, you lost against Serbia, um, against a, just an unbelievable Serbian team. Do you think this could probably be the best national team you've ever played against, that, that Serbia team? Uh, definitely top three. and uh, But it was the same, almost the same team as the one in 2016. And it was, you know... I think it was like 80 or 90% the same guys that dominated from 2014, I want to say, yeah, from 2014 until 2021. That's a seven-year span. That's never happened before. Only the Hungarian team in 2000, 2004, and 2008, which pretty much they, they changed a lot of guys through those eight years. Um, but they didn't win everything. They won gold in uh, Sydney, Athens, and uh, Beijing, but they didn't win everything in between. Serbia almost managed to win everything in between 2014 and 2021. Uh, definitely the, one of the most dominant teams. And, you know, uh, I think we could have won that game, uh, but we were way, way less experienced. We got very excited uh, after beating Hungary, and we definitely lost our focus for a second over there. That's why our defense wasn't the same. That's why we didn't start the game with the same passion and energy that we started the semifinal or the quarterfinal. And I think that is what uh, uh, what made us lose the game. Because as I said earlier with Hungary, if you don't keep them, uh, you know, in defense, if you don't keep the score low, you're going to lose. And that is what happened. We were we were tied 10-10 up until the end of the third quarter. But in the fourth quarter, they just managed to, you know, outplay us in every part of the game. And, I mean, looking back at, at that game, I'm, obviously it hurts. It hurts because who doesn't want to win a final in the Olympics? Uh, however, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be greedy. I'm, I'm super excited and happy uh for that um uh, for that medal yeah uh, it's, it's it's lovely to hear you uh to hear you speak about the olympics and you know the goosebumps and stuff and on the whole a good experience no yeah absolutely great experience cool let's um let's move away from tokyo then because I, obviously i i want to talk about olympiakos i want to talk about your career at the club um you've been been there since 2015 so seven seven or eight years um you've won seven titles there the national championships obviously you're happy there otherwise you, you probably wouldn't be there that long but do you feel under pressure for playing uh playing for such a big club uh definitely uh i think that is what makes uh olympiaco special and different because there's always pressure competing for them because you have to prove that you're the best in every single game, even in an easy game in the Greek league, you know, you can't relax. You can't uh, uh, let your guard down because you're playing for, for the best team in Greece and one of the best teams in Europe. It's the same. I, I assume it's the same feeling as playing for pro reco. You know, you cannot uh, let anyone uh, beat you, not even in, in, you know, in one battle in the game. Um and Olympiakos, what makes it special, as you said earlier, is that it's it's huge fan base here in Greece. The, the Olympiakos has uh, a team for every sport, and there's so many fanatic uh, people just following us, and it's just super super exciting. And it's also what get, you know puts more pressure on us because there's people who actually know us and support us and wants to see us and our team succeed. Uh, but you know, it's it's. I'm here. What seven? Yeah, seven years, seven seasons. I'm I'm used to it. And you know, as I said earlier, I love what I do, and I just and I enjoy my time in Olympiacos. Yeah, you, you you said you said there about letting maybe letting your guard down uh, in the Greek league. Go, maybe you get punished for that. Do you think it is competitive enough? I mean, dating back to I mean, this is long before your time at Olympiacos, but. Day, dating back to 1991, Olympiakos have won 25 of the national titles. So, in, so basically 30 years, 
they've you know they've only they've only lost it not not won it four four times which is massively mm-hmm. dominant you you don't see that in many sports at all you know it'd be insane to see that in something like football um but do do you think that the league it could probably be a little bit more competitive in that respect. I know maybe the standard of the teams lower down in the division is better than maybe other leagues, but in terms of the actual top, um, the actual title, do you think it could probably be a little bit more exciting? Yeah, definitely it could be. Uh, but partially it's also Olympiakos' fault because, uh, you know, as of, I don't want to say 1991, but early 2000s, they started... Uh, investing more money and recruiting all the best Greek players, uh, which automatically gave them the advantage. Um, however, uh, you know, other teams could have done that, but I guess there's not, you know, sponsors or people who want to invest money in a water polo. Uh, Olympiakos has done it successfully, and, you know, it's it's kind of a monopoly here in Greece with Olympiakos. There are teams that are trying, but they need, you know, way more effort to – reach the levels of Olympiacos and actually, you know, make us lose a championship. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, one competition that obviously you're part of that is is very competitive every season is obviously the Champions League. And you've obviously mm-hmm. won you won that competition in in twenty eighteen in a in a fantastic uh fantastic team. Um it's gotta be the aim for this season, no? Yeah, absolutely. Uh you know, this past summer, this team was built um, for the Champions League, um, bringing in, uh, you know, Marco Biac, Andro Buslia, Filip Filipovic, then Yanis Fudulis from uh, Ferenc Varos and uh, Christos Los Colombos, who was playing in in uh, Turkey. Uh, we're also, you know, unfortunate with Juro Radovic, who got punished by uh, Wada and Fina. Um, uh, we were going to be, I think we would have been way better uh, because this season has been really tough, you know, with COVID, with injuries and with a player less, it's been really tough for some of us guys playing four quarters every game in a very competitive league. Um, however, you know, uh, I'm not trying to make any excuses. Uh, we have a few games yet to qualify to the final eight and I just really want to be there and, you know, Obviously, like you said, that's the goal, you know, in the end of the uh, the final eight to be in the final and compete for that first place. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, as you said there, I mean, we've got maybe three or four games left in, in Group A and it's 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 so exciting for, for all of us. Maybe a little bit nervy for maybe Olympiakos and I know Barcelona and Fedenvaros. No one's really secured that, that place to the final eight yet, apart from obviously Novi Biograd who are hosting it. Um, mm-hmm. you've got a few games left, a few really big games. You've got Barcelona, Fedan Varos, and then Novi Biograd. There, you know, and no disrespect to Dinamo Tbilisi, but that's a game that you should you should definitely be winning. There's there's a lot mm-hmm. to there's a lot still to be settled. But how do you how do you make sure that you personally and you as a team are in the top four and you qualify for that final eight? Comp- um, as I said, these past two weeks, we've been training a lot. We've been training hard. Uh, and our mindset is focused on that game against Barcelona, which is, you know, our first final. That's what we call it. It's a final against Barcelona because uh, if we want to be in the top spots of the group, we have to, you know, uh, at least get a tie and uh, at least tie them in the, in Spain when we play in the end of March. Um and then we have two home games against uh, Ferenc Varos and uh, Novi Belgrad. And, you know, uh, my seven seasons here in in, uh, in Olympiacos, uh, we've only lost two games in the Champions League uh, at home. One of them was against Solnok when Solnok won the Champions League in 2017, if I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, 17 and one game uh, a couple months ago against, no, a month ago against Brescia. Um, so, yeah, we definitely don't want to repeat uh, that and lose another game at home. Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I we're all looking forward to play against uh, these teams 
uh, in a really exciting, exciting games in front of our, our, our fans. Um, and then, as you said, that last game against uh, Dinamo Tbilisi, uh, with all due respect, I think we're going to win. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's going to be really exciting to see what's 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 coming up. We've been practicing really hard. Uh, we're just getting better, and I think I think we're going to succeed. Yeah. I mean, you know, you take Tbilisi maybe out of it, but, you know, you, there's been, in, in this group, there's teams that have, beaten teams and the, it seems like anyone can beat anyone um you've played in several seasons in the champions league do you think this is probably the most competitive one yet yeah for sure for sure uh, uh definitely uh, it's the first season that the group stage is uh uh you know like you said all teams can beat all teams and uh uh I don't remember other than last season uh, where Olympiacos wasn't the same due to, you know, everything that happened with COVID. Other than last season, I don't remember uh, being part of a team that wasn't either on first or second place in the group. And we had uh, already, you know, clinched the ticket for the final eight, you know, four or five games before the end of the group play. Uh, so, yeah, definitely this season is uh, more exciting for the fans and more nerve wracking for us. Yeah, I just just want to touch on something you said last season. It was in the Champions League. It was a very disappointing finish, I think it's fair to say, and there might have been um, mitigating factors. Um, but you did finish seventh. There was that game against Barcelona, which was not great. It, it's putting it politely, to be fair. You know, it's a, it's a, it's, it was a it was a heavy defeat and a sort of defeat that we haven't seen Olympiacos suffer in in a long time. And then to lose to Waspo in, in the fifth and eighth playoff is also, uh, you know, is, it's a disappointment, you know, and there might've been reasons why, but what, what do you think was the reason perhaps for underperforming last season? Or was it, as you said, just COVID and it was a one-off few bad few days for you guys? Um, a couple of weeks earlier, we'd have, uh, we had, we won the Greek league. Uh, in an exciting uh, series of games against Buyameni. And then a week before the final eight, we won the Greek Cup in a final four. And I think we we were just empty going in the, into the final eight. I think all of us were a little tired. Uh, obviously, we knew that we weren't favorites for, for that final eight. But definitely, we didn't deserve, mostly for ourselves, you know, losing... Uh, to Barcelona, twenty-two to nine. It's it's embarrassing. It was terrible. I mean, I I I wanted to leave that pool and never come back. To be honest, um, but also we had uh, two of our players, key players, sick. Um, our goalkeeper and uh, Mario Scafocci, who was with us last season. Um, you know, they had food poisoning from the first day we got to Serbia. Uh, uh, I think all of that just you know accumulated to that terrible um score uh, and then uh instead of you know regrouping and beating waspo hanover we managed to lose to them too which i think we were a way better team um we weren't better than barcelona i we knew that um but we were definitely better than the hanover uh but we ended up losing but at least we won the last game against marseille and you know we left serbia with at least a smile on our face and not with three losses. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We won't we won't mention the, we won't mention that tournament again then in this chat. Um <laughs> moving on to someone that's had a very important uh part to play in your development for both club and country, Theo Vlachos, your coach. Um mm -hmm. how important in your words, you know, if if say you you know you don't have to you know give him a tribute or an obituary or anything like that, but is in how how uh, significant a role has he played for you personally, in your opinion? Uh, first of all, I want to mention that um, Coach Lajos was my coach uh, in my club team uh, from when I was thirteen to eighteen oh, before wow. I left for the United States. Wow, okay, so it's even longer than we knew think. Yeah. Yeah, he knew me from when I was a really young kid. Uh, I was only 13 years old when he uh, when he took me to the men's team in that club to practice with them. 
So he saw potential in me from when I was 13 years old, and he trusted me. And uh, when I was in the States from 2000, uh, what, uh, I think 13, uh, 2013, 14, there was another coach who uh, we were in touch, but he didn't really show uh, trust in me. And I want to say respect. He just... He didn't. He didn't want to deal with me for some reason. And as soon as uh, Coach Vlahos was appointed as the coach of the national team, uh, he got in touch with me. He told me that I know what you're capable of, and uh, I really want you to come back and be in the best shape possible. Um, and as I said earlier, I was really focused, and you know, I, I just wanted to prove him right too. And uh, you know, when I came back, I, I tried my best. No, I wasn't sure I was going to make that team in 2015, but, um, you know, two good months of practice before the world championship, uh, gave me, gave me that, that spot on the, on the national team. And I think, it, uh, you know, his, uh, his trust and his, uh, he also took me Olympiacos, uh, in 2015. Some, some people in Olympiacos didn't want me to join, but, um, you know, even though he told me that I wasn't going to be a starter, maybe in some games in the championship, I wouldn't be in the, in the squad. I would be in the stands watching the game, but he told me that he will definitely help me get there. And indeed in the first season, I played only five out of the 12 of 12 or 14 games in the champions league. Um, however, as of the next season, I was almost a starter and playing almost the entire game. Uh, so yeah, I owe him a lot. He trusted me from the first moment he saw me. He trusted me when I got back from the United States, and he's a big part of my success. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's maybe difficult now because uh, for me to ask this because you've had such a long relationship um, with him, spanning so many years in different clubs and obviously national team. But um, what's it like to have uh, your national team coach also as your club coach? Because um, you know, I, I say to a lot of my juniors, I always say to them, you know, train as if your national team coach is standing in the stands. For you, your national team coach is your club coach and he's on the pool side and he sees your work day in, day out. That can obviously be a massive uh, help, um, I think it's fair to say. Also, that can be a lot of pressure because you need to constantly, whereas players that maybe are abroad, they don't, you know, Theo doesn't see what they do day in day out for you the spotlight's on you what's that like yeah i mean you pretty much uh you know explained everything uh on the one hand it's good because uh the national team coach sees your work every day day in day out just like you said and he knows in what kind of shape you are in he's the one responsible for getting you in a shape and uh on the other hand there's a lot of pressure uh, trying to prove yourself every day, but I mean, it, you have to do that, other you know, no matter what. Uh, but also, it can be you know, kind of exhausting uh, in a way that you have to deal with the same person, you know, eleven months every year. Uh, it's not easy for him. It's not easy for us. But I think uh, both him and us have you know. Uh, after so many years, we've connected so much and we know each other's buttons and we know each other's, you know, weak spots and, you know, strengths and we know how to deal with each other. And I think uh, there's a great partnership uh, with all, you know, the coach has a great partnership with all the players. And we have, you know, I think we're we're good enough athletes to keep him pleased all year long. Good, good. You're 28 now, um, I believe, 28. Yeah, I'll be 29 in, in less than two months. Okay, so two months, you're 29. What next for you? You've been at Olympiacos a long time. You've obviously, I mean, you've still got a few years, you know, six, seven, maybe, maybe more of, of playing at, at top level. Is it time for a new challenge? Do you think? Um, you know, I'm not asking for an exclusive here. On, on you know, for you to give me, I'm not asking for that. But um, for you, there there must be a part of you that thinks, well, actually, as you've said, you know, eleven months a year I have to deal with Theo, or you know, a lot of these players, my Greek national team that I play with at Olympiakos. Would a part of you love to? 
go and play in Spain or go and play in Italy or or do something else. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm always open for a new challenge. Um, some players look at it as you know, it's time for me to uh, leave Greece and try something new. Uh, for me, you know, leaving for four years, uh, going to the states was was good enough for me, and that's why I've I haven't really looked into playing for uh, a team outside Greece for the past years. Um, however, uh, I'm always open to you know listening to offers from other teams. However, I'm I'm as I said earlier, very very happy, very very pleased with Olympiacos. Uh, you know, having common goals is really important because, uh, as we said earlier, Olympiacos is one of the biggest clubs in Europe. Uh, they're always competing for the Greek League and the Greek Cup and always in the top teams of the Champions League. So uh, as long as Olympiacos is there and, it, you know, it just keeps me satisfied and we have common goals, I'm just happy to be part of that team. Uh, so, yeah, pretty much, I'm as I said, I'm always... Happy to hear, you know, for opportunities, and you know, I'm always open to uh, new new challenges. Uh, but as of now, I'm I'm pretty happy I'm here. Okay, good, 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 good stuff. Um, look, we'll take a break there, and um, <laughs> after after this little break, we'll uh, we'll come back with some questions that listeners have sent in. Sounds good. All right. Welcome back to part two of the Total Water Polo podcast, and this is the part of the show where we put our questions to Konstantinos, the questions that you've sent in via social media. The first question we'll ask you, Konstantinos, uh, we ask every guest um, for their answer, but who would be your dream team? Who would be your ultimate seven players, past or present, to put in an all-star team? Oh, that's a great question. Um... Uh, I think I would go with uh, Josip Pavic yeah. in the cage. Uh, he was my teammate, and the stuff he would do, and uh, it was just you know unlike I've seen before. And I would definitely go with him. Uh, then with the lefties, um, I think I would go with uh, Filip Filipovic, obviously. Uh, one of the most dominant players of all time. Uh, and I really enjoyed when I was younger uh, watching Kish Gergely, so I would go with Kish Gergely too. Um, now, in the, uh, the center, that's a really tough one because there's so many good ones. Um, I'm not sure who to say. You know, Dusko Pietlovic is great. Ivan Perez for Spain was great. Um, Igor Hinich was great for Croatia. Uh, there's so many to choose from, uh, but if I was to choose um, one, it would it would be Dusko Pietlovic because he's just so, you know, he works so hard both in center and in the in, you know, on six and five in the post, and he just swims well and plays good defense. So I would go with him too. Um, Uh, then for a defender, uh, if it was just about defending, I would definitely go with uh, my teammate Andro Bouchelier. But uh, putting together that you have to play both defense and offense, uh, I would go with uh, uh, Alexander Ivovic because he's really dominant in both uh, ends of the pool. Um, and then... On the left side, it was, you know, again, there's so many players. Uh, my You're not going to be able to fit yourself in the team. Uh, you? uh, definitely not. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. Uh, yeah, for the left side, then I would, uh, I don't know. There's, you know, like I said before, Varga, Danish, Felipe Perone, Yanis Fudulis, uh, absolutely amazing. Um, in the past, uh, Tamas Kasas. I would definitely go with Tamas Kasas because he's just, you know, uh, he's like I don't know. For me, he's like the Michael Jordan of of water polo. He's 
absolutely a pioneer of, of dominating the game and he just brought water polo into another level so definitely one of them is Tomas Kashas and uh, then my last pick would be oof, it would be Danish Varga I cannot I cannot go without Danish you know Felipe Perona and uh, Yanis Fulbulis are right there but I would go with uh Dennis Varga. What a team. What a team. Cool, cool, cool. Mm-hmm. All right, moving on then. Um, I think I probably know the answer to this one, but Nikki Forsept says, what's the fa- favourite moment of your career? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's um, pretty much answers itself. It's definitely uh, winning the medal in Tokyo, 100%. Cool. Nice and quick. Um, yeah. Tom Caram, a friend of mine, uh asks who is the toughest opponent you have ever faced um i guess i guess he maybe means player but i guess you can say a team as well or both um i'll start with a player i think for me it was uh, sandro sukno uh he's just you know too long uh and strong and you know and fast and everything he uh, he was absolutely dominant and uh, really upsetting that his career, you know, had to be stopped earlier. Um, uh, so definitely, yeah, for me, he was, you know, I'm not a big guy. I'm not really tall, not really long. So guarding him was always really tough. And uh, and toughest team, um, definitely Serbia. Uh, national team of Serbia uh, because they were just, you know, just like I said, and they were dominant for so many years. And when it mattered the most, they would just, you know, would just run over every team they had in front of them. So Serbia. You said there that you're not the tallest player. Um, we've got a question here from Michael underscore share it on Instagram. What is your best advice for a shorter water polo player? And he's got in, in brackets, six foot. So, what what's your advice for someone that's? How tall are you, by the way? I'm six one. I'm uh, one eighty three. Okay. So it's six one. Okay. So, what would your advice be? Uh, first of all, it doesn't really matter if you're the the tallest or the shortest. Uh, there's definitely uh, an advantage being taller and longer. Um, however, you know, there's many, many, many good players that are not very tall. Look at Felipe Perone, look at, uh, Francesco Di Fulvio, um, I can't, uh, uh, Fatovic from Croatia, you know, they're not the biggest guys, but they're very, very good at what they do. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, if there was one advice I could give is just every day be the, the most hardworking, you know, person in the pool and in, in the weight room. That's only how you can get, you know, faster, stronger, so you can, uh, you know, so you don't have any weaknesses. And when other players have advantages that God gave them, uh, you just have created advantages for yourself being faster and stronger. Nice, nice advice. Um, Christos.1925 asks, what's your favorite goal that you've ever scored? Uh, easy answer. Um, semi-final against Pro Reco in the final eight in the semi-final in Hanover, 2019. Do you want to, It was the winning do goal. You, do you want to describe it to for, for, for those that that don't can't picture it? I'm sure it's, uh-huh. it's on the, it's on YouTube. I, I I've seen it seen it before. Yeah, so it was uh, the semi-final against Pro Reco. We were up all game and. Uh, they ended up tying us, uh, I think, 11-11 uh, with 30, no, with 53 seconds to go. And there's one possession for us, one possession for them. Uh, by the way, I totally messed up. I, I was the guy responsible for almost three or four goals received by Reco. Uh, so I had, you know, chip on my shoulder. Uh, I was really you know, bothered by myself that I, I, I messed it all up and, uh, we have no timeouts and ball is on position three and 
Uh, I'm giving the ball in position to around nine or 10 meters away from the cage. And that's when I get a foul and I see that our center is just going back and we had nothing to do. So as soon as I, you know, take a look and see that this is happening, I just grab the ball and I get as high as I could and just rip the ball in the cage from, from 10 meters diagonal. And, you know, my teammate now, Marco Biatch was the goalkeeper, uh, and he didn't manage to get it. We went top corner, and it was just, you know, all the emotions, uh, just scoring the winning goal in a semifinal. It was just unbelievable. I'm not sure the goal was better than the celebration. <laughs> definitely not. Be definitely fair. not. No, it was a, obviously a worldie. Um, Chicky underscore Nuggy, I like the name, by the way, says, who's the best goalkeeper you've ever faced? Oh, there's so many, so many. Um, is that is there a goalkeeper that you know? Maybe you don't want to say it now because they're still playing, and you have to play them in like two or three weeks, so they don't want to get in your head. But <laughs> is there a goalkeeper that when you pick up the ball, you're like, uh, I don't really fancy this, or do you not do you not feel like that? Do you feel like against any keeper, you can put the ball away? To be honest, uh, I'm really confident and. I always feel like I can score a goal. Uh, that's maybe not too good for my teammates because I might shoot a little more. <laughs> but um, I faced I faced so many good goalkeepers. I can't even you know I I, I don't know. I I I played two games against Josip Pavic. I was fortunate enough uh, for him being my teammate for five what four or five seasons. Uh, and uh, I didn't have the chance to play with him before I got back from the uh, United States. Um, however, I remember playing against him in Kazan and uh, in one more game in 2016, and, you know, it was tough playing against him, but um, I can't really say because he wasn't my opponent for many times. Uh, you know, Dani Lopez Pinedo is always great. Victor Nagy was always great. Uh, Bane Mitrovic was always great. Um, so I, I, I can't really say about one goalkeeper. Marco Biac is always great, you know, playing against him both with Reco and the Croatian national team. Who else? Dolungo is great. So yeah, I can't really say about one goalkeeper. It's it's really tough. That's, that's the toughest, that's quite, quite toughest question to answer. That's fine. If you can't say one, just name them all. It's all it's all good. Um, this is an interesting <laughs> question, um, and I it I wonder what the answer will be. Is um, Tayo underscore Tayoto asks, "What are you aware of when shooting and passing?" It's quite a philosophical question, but like, um, yeah, it's it's quite interesting. I mean, when. Uh, when I'm passing, uh, I assume he's asking about, uh, you know, when passing to a teammate or, you know, trying to give an assist, uh, you always got to be aware of, uh, you know, uh, for me, the most important is uh, the positioning of your teammates, you know, body, you know, you got to know uh, where to place the ball. Uh, when he's swimming, you know, you got to, you know, place it in front of him on the water. When he's ready to shoot, you got to perfectly place it on his hand so he can quickly shoot so definitely body positioning and awareness of where uh the opponents are uh is always important and then uh when thinking about shooting uh, again it's uh you know placement of the goalkeeper placement of the of your shot blockers and uh you know my uh, beating the shot blockers it wasn't always my strength. So I always try to kind of trick the goalkeepers. Uh, so when I shoot, I always try to, you know, uh, try to do something that they don't expect. Um, so in my mindset, when I'm shooting, I'm always trying to, you know, and, you know, not exactly. It's not uh, it's trying to outsmart them, you know, trying to, uh, catch them off guard okay good advice good advice we've got a, <laughs> uh, we've got another one that i suspect to know the answer to it's theo underscore panoretos he's greek so 
mm -hmm. question is, what's your favourite moment with the national team? Uh, yeah, uh, Tokyo, 2021, sure. 100%. Okay. Um, got a question here from K. Pulial. I'll repeat, repeat that because I've completely butchered the name. K. Pouliasis. <laughs> It's this all the Greek the Greek names that I can't pronounce. Um, do you have any tips for when you play with an extra man slash man up? Um, tips for me, uh, you know, the most important is uh, passing. Uh, when you have good rhythm and good passes on six and five, uh, you know, the defense cannot be faster than the ball. So you always got to be a step ahead when passing, and good passing on six and five is key. Key passing, okay, that's that's good. We've got um, we've got two more. Firstly, Montas Seven has got in touch. He asks, who is the better poker player, Chris Colombos or Konstantinos Mouriques? <laughs> better poker player. Um... <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I guess both of them are good. You know, you, sometimes. Do you play poker a lot? The... Uh, um, sometimes, not a you lot. Dress you dress up know. and, you uh, know, have a casino night? Or, no, not really. <laughs> not really. Yeah, just uh, sometimes at home. But, you know, uh, mostly uh, during COVID where we couldn't go out. But now we've, I don't know, we haven't Got played that much. Um yeah, I got better things to do. Uh, but yeah, I, I want to say both of them are good. And uh, maybe Chris Columbus is a little better. Okay, <laughs> all right, fine, fine. Last question we've got, and this is this is not one that anyone sent in, but we do ask it just to you know get to know our guests a little bit more. But outside of water polo, um, what does your life consist of? What are your hobbies? What are your general interests? Um, what do you spend your downtime relaxing to do yeah uh, my i don't really have any hobbies i just uh, enjoy uh going to the movies i've always enjoyed that uh i've enjoyed uh either at home or going to the, the movie theaters That's, that was always one thing i loved to do from when i was young uh i've had a girlfriend for three years now so my life is pretty you know mellow without a lot of going out and a lot of partying and everything um so yeah my my you know off time pretty much consists of uh relaxing with friends uh with friends enjoying time more family uh i visit my family a lot they're not too far away uh so yeah that's pretty much it i enjoy going out for dinner for good dinner or good lunch you know and then in the summer, just some good vacation, you know, on the beach, relaxing, trying to refill my batteries for the next season. Perfect. Perfect. Great answers. Uh, that's all we have, Konstantinos. Thank you so much for joining us. You've been really interesting. Great. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look, it was short but sweet today, but it was a really, really cool conversation with a really honest, down-to-earth and obviously an unbelievable water polo player. We wish Konstantinos all the best luck uh, for the rest of the season. We wish him the best of luck in the Champions League. And he's been so pivotal in that Olympiakos squad and in that Greek national team that obviously won silver at Tokyo. Um, really great conversation, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I hope you did too. Just a reminder, just before you go, please, if you can, give us a like, give us a subscribe or leave a review anywhere that you're listening to this podcast, whether that's Apple, whether that's Spotify or Google, Amazon, wherever it is, should be available. And of course, we want to we want to help you save a bit of money on, on buying kit, buying trunks. We know it can be expensive sometimes, but, but using our podcast discount code, podcast10, you can save 10% off your next order. Why not? Go and have a look if there's anything you like. A lot of it's very good. It's very good for the environment good quality all the rest of it you know it already podcast 10 save yourself a bit of money thank you very much for listening enjoy your weekend <laughs>